Monte Hellman had filmmaking in his blood, empowered by directorial creativity expressed within the films of John Huston and materially empowered by the finances of Roger Corman. Under Corman, Hellman emerges as the most visually fluid, aesthetically interesting of the American B-movie directors who emerged under that indie titan, possibly including Francis Coppola. I already heaped praise upon Hellman's directorial debut, 1959's Beast from Haunted Cave, a silent horror classic which had the misfortune of being realised as a Corman-produced B-horror genre title and so has been neglected by film discourse. Then, his 1964 war quickie, Back Door to Hell, is among my favourite garage, proto-macaroni combat, cinema enthusiasm outings ever recorded. But more than that, Back Door to Hell opts for chilling existentialism rather than thrilling set pieces. This isn't to say that Hellman was a great existentialist, although that could be the case, so much as it enforces my belief that cinema, as Goddard stated in his brilliant Wrong Man critique, is the most suitable medium with which to articulate the quote data of consciousness, unquote. Hellman sought to prove, or he may as well have intended to prove, how effortlessly cinema could communicate the internal malaise of human experience. Filmed back to back with Backdoor to Hell and on both on location in the Philippines was the same year's Flight to Fury. What Flight to Fury immediately reminds me of is Hellman's later acid western, 1966's The Shooting. The Shooting is not an acid western as Hodorowski envisioned it, but something subtler, closer to psilocybin than a surgide. To be more, to be less vague, weird, but not surreal, hallucinatory, but not trippy. To be even less vague, more intuitively stream of consciousness Lord Byron Gothic romanticism than a cross countercultural psychedelic hedonism. Not to bemoan that, I like both. So I think of Flight to Fury as a weird noir. We are in 1964, so this might qualify as a neo-noir rather, and that is an important distinction here. Noir tropes utilised for their own sake, as though they were fantasy archetypes, is a loose description of neo-noir mythos. Though I am tempted to invoke, as Flight to Fury can't help but remind me of, Orson Welles' The Lady from Shanghai, with its shameless languishing in the film world rather than our real world. I often remark upon Jean Renoir's The Woman on the Beach as having a similar sort of affect. More directly, Flight to Fury was conceived of by screenwriter Jack Nicholson as a homage to John Huston's 1953 stream of consciousness craziness that is Beat the Devil. I always enjoyed the idea behind Beat the Devil more so than Beat the Devil. In fact, I feel as though the apparent, I suspect, laziness behind Huston and Capote's work ethic on Beat the Devil was transmutated into an optimistic enthusiasm manifested by Jack Nicholson's apparent screenwriting imagination, written during the production of Backdoor to Hell, so I read and Hellman's effortlessly filmic depictions of that said print. The distinction here is, obviously, of Nicholson writing whatever he felt like, regardless of structure or established codes, except in advance of the production, anticipating the finished film to reflect this, an evocative stream of consciousness trip which operates under dynamic archetypes and romantic, as in Byron Shelley, Coleridge and Co., narrative highs. Houston and Capote's work, on the other hand, appears to reflect a more, eh, let's just do it on the day, approach of procrastination as opposed to believing in the virtues of free association artistry. Obviously fans of Beat the Devil, and we're confidently assuming that Nicholson, Hellman, et al. were, consider it to be a positive manifestation of that train of thought slippery dip approach to film writing and subsequent direction. So much so that Flight to Fury was composed of its creative ethos directly inspired by that of Beat the Devil's. So, I, I've before compared Hellman's budding style, especially when it was photographed in black and white, to the natural grandiosity which every image of a silent film could exude. Even the now familiar, tired image of two men pointing pistols at one another retains a stark power when retrospectively experienced during a silent era film. Hellman doesn't deliberately restore this affect. It is more that he, like the silent pioneers, like the Edwin Porters themselves, believed in the power of every single image. Hellman makes manifest how even an independent, lower-budgeted film production is capable of an aesthetic power which doesn't require the anxious investments of cynical producers. Well, or at least qu quite as much investment, let's say. This film did cost $80,000. Tarantino and Reservoir Dogs operated on this principle to some degree as well, considering a dynamic vector for all images. You do remember that iconic Mexican standoff shot in Reservoir Dogs which the film used to market itself. His initial success owed everything to this principle, and he is the poster child of independent filmmaker success story today. Jack Nicholson appears to weave his narrative of Monty Hellman in mind, knowing how well Backdoor to Hell was turning out, he perhaps anticipated the young director's ability to cinematically realise his loose, impulsive, pulpy screenplay, which still reminds me of the lady from Shanghai's gorgeously mesmerising laxity of narrative, or at least completely material coherence. 
So the young Monty Hellman and Jack Nicholson managed to positively invoke in me memories of the lady from Shanghai, and all on an $80,000 production budget. What brilliant, audacious, imaginative enthusiasm and confidence these young guys had. All it takes is a creative vision, uncynical ambition, artistic integrity, and a budget of at least $80,000. Well, I mean, sometimes I wonder, why aren't I making all these films? And it's like, oh right, my bank account is <laughs> barely over a third of that. I remember now. Anyway, check out Flight to Fury if you are so inclined. Have a fantastic day.